Hello, everybody. We are starting the webinar of the EMS Task Force for Emerging Technologies and Innovations in Neurosurgery. My name is Nikolai Gavrovsky, and today we're going to talk about ChatGPT and the influence that ChatGPT have on uh, medicine and particularly in neurosurgery. As we know, these large language models uh, have already We know that uh, ChatGPT have already influenced a lot our everyday work, uh, the way we communicate, the way we write scientific papers, the way we are elaborating our everyday plans. How ChatGPT will influence neurosurgery in the future, of course, is a very interesting question. Definitely, we shall rely on these new systems to have a diagnostic support and to have a better clinical decision making. Already, we have some results, scientific results, that clearly demonstrated that this type of models can learn very fast and can achieve very good results that will support us in our everyday work. Of course, such type of models will influence a lot the medical education and training. Uh, probably, we will not have teachers in the near future, only uh, in most of the, of the part of the educational process. So, uh, there will be a lot of changes for us as faculties. Uh, of course, patient education and engagement is another uh, perspective, of, perspective of development of uh, these models. And we ho hope to have um, an easier and better interaction with patients thanks to these new models. But how, how will chat GPT and this type of uh, learning models, how, uh, they, how will they influence the way we create science? How uh, will they influence the way we create, create the scientific content? Um, so it's uh, not an easy question to answer. That's what we have today. Martin, uh, Associated uh, Professor Majewski, uh, who will talk us about this topic. So Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, we'll be very glad to hear your speech. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Martin Majewski, and I'm a neurosurgeon in uh, Charles University in Prague in Central Military Hospital. Uh, I am very excited to, to share my uh, small knowledge about, about the large language models. I will just start my presentation. Um, do you see that now? Okay. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, I would like to talk about academic and clinical implications of large language models. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to make a disclaimer. I'm, I'm not an expert in, um, in uh, computer science or uh, artificial intelligence. I am a neurosurgeon. My, my uh, the daily work is the same as yours. And uh, I was lucky to, to, to meet very, very good people that are interested in, um, in new technologies and in artificial intelligence. And we created a small research group at our department. It includes myself, uh, my, my boss, David Netuka, and uh, Martin Cherny, who is, uh, who is resident, uh, a neurological, neurosurgical resident, and he has a very strong um, IT background. So uh, we try to uh, explore the new realms of, of AI in neurosurgery. Uh, I will not talk much about the theory. Uh, the, the, the AI became a buzzword, um, AI, machine learning, neural networks. We hear that every day. But is it a really intelligence? I wouldn't say so. I think that the, all these uh, tools that we are talking about, that we are using, it's it's in the category of uh, weak AI. We haven't really reached the, the face of the strong AI, the universal artificial intelligence. And uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not happy with the term neurons because it implies, it implicates the, uh, that the architecture of the neural networks are somehow based on architecture of our brains, but it's, uh, it's not really so. The, the, this uh, term neural networks comes from um, many, many, many years back, uh, but it proved that the architecture of, uh, of brain is very much different than today's neural networks. 
What we are uh, uh, trying to investigate at our department is um, generative AI. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's mainly natural language processing. It means large language models. We also work on um, classification AI, uh, mainly on image recognition. We have ongoing project on um, automatic segmentation of, uh, of uh, pituitary adenomas MRIs. Um, and it's the mainly mainly task of my colleague Martin Cherny that I've mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, yeah, this is this uh, this uh, image on the right hand side um, is the the project on on pituitary adenomas and automatic segmentation. So, very briefly, how does it work? Large language models. It is uh, it is a. Uh, architecture of, uh, that is trained on large text corpus or on big data. It includes Wikipedia, uh, millions of books, millions of text across the internet, including uh, discussion sections of, of many websites and so on. The model is trained on these um, on this uh, text uh, corpus and then it's uh, adapted to, to to do very specific tasks and to create to create the language that is similar to uh, to natural human language. Uh, to explain maybe some some uh, problems with with uh, large language models that all of us know, um, let me let me explain how how does it choose the uh, answers. It's trained on the text. And then it's uh, given the prompt. That's the question that we give to the model. Let's say uh, the Trevi Fountain is in which uh, which city, and it, based on the training data, it answers, but answers in a statistical way. So most of the most of the answers that it will be trained on will be, of course, Rome, the correct answer. But definitely there will be some um, I don't know jokes, whatever, wrong information. So. At a very uh, small number of uh, cases, it can answer wrongly. That's what uh, sometimes is called hallucinations. So it's not that the it's not hallucination that we understand the word that that uh, it's giving the wrong information because of some internal uh, problem. But it's the architecture of the model. It, that's how it's built. So uh, uh, we should we should see it differently than we see the hallucination in patients. Uh, what is very important for medical field is that we have these uh, large foundation models like GPT, like Claude, like BART, and then it could be fine tuned. And in medical, uh, in, in medicine, we can fine tune it on, on specific medical data and we can improve very significantly the, the quality of output of these large language models. Uh, just few words about the evolution of LLMs. Uh, and this guy on the picture, it's Tomasz Mikolov. It's a Czech computer scientist. And it's uh, he's the most cited Czech scientist. He has more than 150 um, thousands of citations. And his invention stands behind the, the great explosion of, of language models in last years. And uh, the tool is called um, word to vec and it's a tool that um, that uh, classifies the the words in vectors in uh, not in three dimension that we are used to, but in in much more dimensions. And uh, this enabled the the development of the, the high quality uh, language models. just just to explain very briefly uh, how it works. Uh, each word has its position in a, in a, in a space and there are specific connections. For example, there, the word man has a obvious relation to word woman. And it's the same relation as has word king to word queen. And, and what he shows, what he's um, showing the, as an example, you can use um, these vectors and you can calculate, you can use them in a, in a equation. So for example, if you would take a man minus king, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, if you take a king minus man plus woman, you get the queen. So you can make uh, equations with these with these uh, words in, in, in vectors. 
this is a quite busy slide. It's uh, it's showing the the evolution tree of large language models. What we are talking about today is are these um, decoder only large language models. So you can see the BART, you can see, see Llama, Claude, uh, GPT is definitely somewhere here. And and that's what we that's what we use um, in our everyday life. And as you might see at the bottom over here, this is the word to back the the software that was developed by the Czech scientists. Scientist. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, first part is going to be large language models in academic work. Um, I would talk. Uh, I will talk about the academic fraud, how LLMs can be used um, to create fraudulent articles. I'm going to talk about uh, how computer-generated text can be detected, or if it's even possible to reliably detect um, computer or AI-generated texts. And then I will focus on, on um, genuine, gen genuine um, academic work and how to help uh, ourselves uh, during our uh, academic work and how to help ourselves to create um, the articles from writing abstract to uh, making statistics to making tables and, and maybe references. The second part of my talk is going to be uh, using LLMs in, in clinical uh, neurosurgery. And it uh, mainly, uh, and I mean by that mainly, uh, data extraction, da data mining, mining uh, from unstructured data in electronic patient record and turning them into the tabular da data that can be used for further analysis. So uh, we were first intrigued by ChatGPT uh, in version 3.5. And this is very important that we use the uh, the this version uh, that was made publicly available from uh, November 22. And we asked ourselves, what are the capabilities of this uh, of these large language models? Can it can it create the completely completely fabricated uh, text? Um, uh, would it be uh, like uh, credible? So we started prompting the GPT. And we started uh, suggest relevant RCT in field of neurosurgery that is suitable uh, for PLOS medicine journal and have high chance of acceptance. We 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 chosen this um, this specific uh, journal because um, it's the 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 open access uh, journal with highest impact factor, and we believed that uh, maybe some of the journals were um, a part of the training data of this um, of this ChatGPT. So it could replicate the the article in a correct form, um, in a correct um, citation format, for example. And ChatGPT uh, suggested several uh, several topics. Uh, we have chosen deep brain stimulation in pharmacoresistant depression, and we iteratively um, asked the ChatGPT to generate uh, introduction methods, results. Uh, discussion, conclusion, tables, references. And uh, we were very, very surprised that uh, it really followed our instructions. And after maybe one hour of um, of uh, getting acquainted with the with the whole thing, um, we we were able to to make him create the very, very uh, good result. Uh, we 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 have published uh, this. Um, in in Journal of Medical Internet Research, we didn't want to really submit this uh, fraudulent article and 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 uh, try to try to publish it. We we were uh, very open. We said what we tried to do. We included this fraudulent article as a as a supplement to our to our paper, and we described how we did it. This is just to show you an uh, example of the generated article. I will not read everything, but uh, as you can see, it is uh, it really follows the standard um, standard structure of a randomized controlled trial paper. There are numbers, there are basic statistics. Uh, it is uh, it 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 works very well together. So if you look at the statistics, uh, there is no obvious um, flaw of it. We have. Um, 
asked uh, our colleagues from psychiatry and statistician to, to go through the paper. And uh, we didn't really find any, any major flaw. One thing that was not correct uh, was citations. Some of the citations were non-existing, approximately half of the citations, but the, the other half was, was perfect, uh, perfect citations of, of uh, papers that were published on this topic before. Uh, I, I want to stress once more that it was a version GPT 3.5. So it was it has limited um, training data time frame. And it has not um, access to the to the internet or to the PubMed, as today's GPT-4 uh, Turbo has. So that's why the some of the citations were were uh, were wrong. And one very minor thing that we noticed that in such a paper RCT there should be mentioned a clinicaltrials.gov um, registration number. But it's really the minor minor thing that we that we saw. Um, we replicated this um, this research also in Czech language. Obviously, the Czech language is very specific. We have only ten million inhabitants, so obviously the the training data uh, had only a limited number of um, text in Czech language. But we 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 proven the same thing. The Czech GPT was able to create the, the complete article in Czech language as well. So this this whole thing doesn't mean that uh, that um, now uh, the cheating is on. Uh, the, we have a long history of academic fraud. Uh, uh, you, uh, I'm sure that you all know about the uh, the uh, this paper on a connection of autism and and MMR uh, vaccination that was uh, retracted from from Lancet. We have all these paper mails. We have predatory journals, mega journals. Uh, so it's not that uh, now everyone can cheat. I think it doesn't enable uh, scientists to cheat. It only makes it much more easier. And it makes very hard today to, to, for publishers or for universities to, to check texts that are submitted um, if they are genuine or, or cre created by the by the large language models. So I will conclude this this uh, part um, where we uh, demonstrated that GPT is able to to make very, very good, uh, fraudulent article. This, uh, as, as a reaction on this, obviously, there is a high demand for detectors of computer generated text by the publishers and by the by the academic institutions that need to uh, check uh, many many theses of the of the students and uh, very very obviously many many uh, tools for for computer generated text detection are emerging uh, some of them are free uh, some of them are paid some of them are even experimental and and if you probably you've tried some of them. You see the nice website, you see this very nice uh, percentage, how many of the presented text is, is uh, AI generated, uh, what percentage is human generated. These tools claim very, very high accuracy, as you may see on this table, uh, far beyond 90% um, of, of uh, accuracy or reliability. Uh, sadly, these claims, uh, these fantastic claims, are not uh, backed by any evidence. So, uh, this is a very nice paper by Weber and Wolf, created, uh, uh, published last year, that uh, rigorously che uh, checked the ability of these uh, tools to uh, to to detect uh, computer generated text. As and as you may see. Uh, the results are not that great as um, as shown on a previous slide. The average reliability is from fifty to let's say seventy percent. The best the best result um, was provided by uh, Turnitin, which is probably mostly used most used um, uh, plagiarism anti plagiarism software by by the universities. But still. 
80%, it's not a great job. It's not something that you can really rely on, right? Um, it gives a um, significant number of false positive and false negative uh, results, obviously. And uh, authors of that paper concluded that uh, these models show bias towards classifying output as human written rather than, than generated text. Uh, there is a high risk of, of false um, positive results and wrongful rejection of theses or, or, or papers. So it cannot be reliably used um, um, to, to, to make a decision on the level of, of uh, publishers or, or universities. That is, that is for sure. Uh, we wanted to, to write a, a article or commentary on this topic. We were very lucky that uh, that we joined with uh, Tomasz Mikolov, the, the Czech computer scientist that I that I mentioned mentioned previously, and we have published recently this this commentary. Uh, we wanted to call it "Perfect Detection of Computer Text is Impossible." However, the editor of the of the journal wanted to change it, so now it's um, not impossible. Now it faces fundamental challenges, but but the message is clear. I think uh, we we truly believe that. Um, there are fundamental problems in creating reliable uh, detector. Now I will try to 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 show some um, some arguments to support my claim. Um, obviously, in brief sentences, it's it's impossible to 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 say whether it's um, it's uh, computer generated or not because if you if you make a statement like a water molecule consists of an oxygen atom and and two hydrogen atoms. Uh, or if you say Prague is capital of Czech Republic, you cannot you cannot decide if if this uh, is uh, human created or, or computer generated. Uh, in longer text, uh, there might be some uh, some patterns that can be recognized by some by some algorithms, uh, but still it it will achieve only only some degree of precision. The, the models are uh, trained on, on Wikipedia, and if you replicate the, the sentence from Wikipedia, uh, the, 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 there, is no, there is no difference. Uh, there is a possibility to, to include human discriminators, uh, but still, they, they, may, they may notice some, some, some inconsistencies in the text, but they may be uh, very well created by the humans. So, so we don't see that this is a, a feasible way to, to go. Uh, the, the, the detectors that I have uh, shown, um, these that claim very high accuracy, uh, they, has also, they have also a critical flaw. I will explain myself on this on this uh, chart. Let's say that we have a generator model, the, the, the model that creates the text, let's say GPT, and it creates the his own text. And then you have a human text on the same topic, and then you have the second model, the detector model, the D. It will decide uh, whether it's uh, human generated or computer, uh, human written or computer generated, it will give the result. But at this point, you can use these results and of the D to improve the generator and to, to overcome uh, this ability to, to generate, uh, to, to detect uh, computer generated text. I hope I, I explained it uh, simply. This is called in computer science, it's called generative adversarial networks. And it's the it's the basic idea that you can always use the results and try to improve and to overcome ability of detection. There are many approaches, uh, and I, I will not go into the into the details because, as I said, I'm not expert in. Uh, I will just mention them. There is possibility of watermarking the, the computer generated text to somehow embed some uh, some patterns inside the computer generated text uh, to be recognizable. But uh, this can be easily overcome by rephrasing. You can create a model that will just rephrase your text and then it's losing this watermarking. There is another uh, approach and it's called logging, uh, but it, uh, it involves the, the, the detector has access to all the uh, responses by the specific large language models, and it can compare the results to these previously um, created results and, and, and try to detect. 
but again it has it has um, some flaws and we discuss this more in into the detail in our paper uh, to be to, to make it uh, to make a simple uh, to make it simple the selection pressure on generators will uh, just boost the development uh, of these models to to evade detection uh, some kind of arms race as we have an arms race between the pathogen and the and the host organism that's the same thing in um, in 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 this uh, field many people uh, rely on regulations uh, in eu there was recently um, approved this ai act in us they have executed order on ai uh, that are trying uh, somehow regulate the, the this this field but uh, the thing is what about the others uh, what about uh, the china what about other entities they they will not uh, wait for us until we we decide how to regulate they will not regulate their own uh, market uh, or their own development of the of these uh, tools and that's why we believe that the regulation will fail at uh, at some point and we even see it as a contraproductive because the overregulation may just lead to stagnation of uh, maybe uh, european tech industry but it will not slow the others and, and and it may it may lead to it may leave us behind the the development of these tools um so uh we, we believe that the attempts to solve primary ethical problem by technological means is um, is futile we will rather accept we, we should accept the llms as a writing tool and maybe somehow overhaul the review process uh, what we suggest in in our commentary in uh, as a reply to our uh, article is um, so, uh, several points that that may be considered uh, to improve the current review process we believe that there is not one silver bullet that that can solve the 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 problem but 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 this point may help we we suggest to authors to provide anonymized um uh, data sets publicly um we we um, put a very strong um, accent on a meticulous review process uh, respectable publishers uh, should should very carefully pick the reviewers and maybe some kind of review award system may be put in place to to motivate the reviewers because you know today it's it's just the goodwill of the reviewers to 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 spend the time and and to consider the papers for publish publication. Uh, obviously, strict ethical regulation on the level of public publishers uh, on the level of academic institution to make the penalties of of, of to the researchers who commit the ethical misconduct uh, that is obvious. And and what I believe it, this leads somehow to to the world where we will have these credible journalists with the credible editors and credible authors that you know that this particular person that he really does research in this area so you really believe that his um, his um, article is good and is genuine and it may lead to uh, maybe to decline of, of the these thousands of predatory journalists and mega journalists because no one will really care what is published uh, published there because it can be just fabricated you know uh now let's go i i'm a little bit lay, late as i see the the time uh let's go into the genuine academic writing uh today i use llms for many many steps uh, during the writing process uh, it can be used in the data collection. I will talk about it a little bit later. It can be used for data analysis, including the th statistics. It can be used for manuscript drafting, uh, maybe for the relevant literature search, abstract creation, English editing. And why we use it? Because it's it's time saving very much. Uh, I will talk about, because what I use mainly is uh, GPT-4. It has extended training data. It has this advanced analytics function that is using uh, Python. Uh, it is, this can assess statistics very nicely. It has multimodal input. You can give text, tables, images, even voice input. It has access to search engine uh, and, and even to uh, websites, uh, to PubMed, for example. 
So it's very, very useful tool. Um, it is very good in data analysis. Uh, you just provide a spreadsheet and it will analyze it. If you, if you give some more information, if you give some uh, description of the spreadsheet, it can give very good results in terms of statistical analysis. And it will even not, not only suggest, but it will even create the relevant tables and relevant charts. I use it, uh, yeah, I have it here. I use it to create the Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, curve that, uh, that I was unable to make myself in, in MS Excel for a few hours. And then the ChatGPT created me a nice Kaplan-Meier in, in a blink of an eye, let's say. Uh, sometimes I use it in manuscript drafting. Uh, I use it mainly for, let's say, rephrasing or extending my, my ideas. I just um, put in four sentences and I ask him to, to maybe improve my English, improve my uh, the text flow and, and to uh, make it a little bit longer. Then, of course, you need to check it because it's not perfect uh, always. But it's 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 very helpful. It can be used uh, for literature search. We are not there yet that it can be really used to to search and to find all the relevant um, um, articles for the purpose of review article. Uh, you still need it to do it manually. But I'm sure that um, soon we will see we will see some dedicated tools uh, that will that will be able to do that. Uh, what is very nice to use it for abstract creation because at the end, if you finish your manuscript, uh, you you need to really step back and, and and to do the abstract is somehow somehow difficult. So it's perfect for this. It's very good to suggest a catchy title that will that will describe your paper um, uh, nicely, and obviously is excellent um, for English language editing. Um, spelling, text flow, as I mentioned before, and to be honest, we don't uh, we don't use the uh, native speaker proofreading anymore uh, nowadays. Uh, and now uh, let's move to the to the data extraction. It's the last part of my talk, and it's more a clinical um, a clinical use, but it has also overlap into the academic um, academic area. Uh, what we believe that that we every day we create a large amount of uh, electronic patient record and it's mostly unstructured data. All our reports, outpatient reports, um, hospitalization reports, it's unstructured data. And uh, if we want to analyze our results, if we want to maybe create a retrospective studies, we need to go back. We need to dive into this um, data, and it's very time consuming. It demands. Uh, uh, doctor uh, or at least a nurse to go through all these data and it it takes time and we believe that uh, large language models are excellent to create uh, structured tabular data from unstructured data so we conducted this prospective study to analyze this potential this this usage and i i, I may share the preliminary results with you with you today we enrolled uh, patients during one month period we obtain informed consent from everyone um, that we will use their um, anonymized data um, and we will send it to, to ChatGPT. And we also perform the manual extraction to, to create a ground truth to compare the results of ChatGPT with, uh, with, uh, with our ground truth. We uh, try to uh, extract uh, different data points so the questions were uh, were uh, were uh, made um, yes or no, numeric, multiple choice, or free text. Uh, we created we 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 designed total thirty five data points. We uh, exported electronic patient record. Uh, technically, all the reports that were created during the uh, hospitalization. It underwent. Uh, very, very um, strict anonymization, which is crucial. You need to delete not only the names, uh, dates of birth, but also dates of admission, date of surgery, any any other identifiers, uh, for example, uh, 
where is the hospital where he was uh, reported from. It, it it was really, really time consuming to do this, but we needed to, to make it like this because we are sending the very, very sensitive data to some third party uh, servers. And we prompted uh, not only GPT, but also uh, some other LLMs. Um, and we in, we instructed the models to to respond in machine readable JSON format uh, to to make it easier. We have enrolled in total 172 patients, and uh, this is chart uh, what we did. It's basically I described it already. Uh, two of us, two doctors, uh, did a manual extraction and created ground truth, and the electronic. Uh, records were anonymized and sent to the LLM and then it was compared the extracted data with the ground truth. We also need to do a manual manual uh, comparison because as you may see uh, one answer could be high grade glioma parietal occipital uh, dexter and the second one could be glioblastoma parietal right and we consider this uh, this answer as as um, as sound as as concordant. These are the preliminary results that I am sharing with you. We prompted not only GPT-4, but only GPT-3.5, BART, Claude 2, and NeuroGPT X, uh, which, uh, which is um, GPT that was uh, fine-tuned on, on medical, uh, medical data. And as you may, may see, the results are, are quite good. Um, uh, the best results were, were provided by, uh, by GPT-4, Claude, and NeuroGPTX, very high number of um, complete um, complete answers, and maybe more important is this bar chart on the right bottom, uh, where uh, is number or percentage of correct answers, and uh, as you may see, the best results were given by NeuroGPTX, um, and the best performance was, uh, which is kind of intuitive was in yes or no yes or no questions it's not perfect but the re evolution in this field is very very rapid and these uh, models are are rather, rather general and, and and only gptx is fine-tuned but it was fine-tuned on limited number of articles on vestibular schwannomas so it's not really a um, model that is designed to to do this uh, to do this job um, so what are the limitations? Uh, obviously, the, our documentation was in Czech language. I, I believe that uh, that uh, this will work better in, in other languages, in English, maybe in German. Uh, if any of you is interested to, to help us in, in our future in future projects, I'm, I would be very happy to, to collaborate with someone and to try to do the same in, let's say, in German or in English. Uh, lim another limitation is um, is the quality of our patient record. I will not uh, go much more into this for obvious reasons. Um, we tested limited number of LLMs and uh, we tested the LLMs at some point. Uh, and as I said, the evolution is very, very, um, very fast. So last slide of my presentation, what are the future directions? Uh, I'm pretty sure that we will see soon domain-specific models, domain-specific, uh, not only, I mean, for medical use, but maybe for uh, for neurosurgical use. And it will give much more better results in all the tasks that I discussed today in, in text generation for purpose of uh, article creation, as well as uh, in the data mining from the patient record. Uh, it will implement uh, in our everyday work, that is for sure, it's already started. Uh, we will see dedicated um, writing tools uh, for for um, scientists. I think we need to uh, think how to change the review process to improve the, the quality of um, uh, of, of uh, publishing uh, of published papers. Um, I think we will see uh, see some domain specific patient chatbots. Uh, Nicola, I mentioned that uh, it's it's obvious for our patients. It will be much easier to to discuss some some minor problems with the chatbot than to wait for for um, their doctors. And I believe that the uh, limiting factor is not technology, but more ethical and legal challenges that we need to face. Uh, as I said. 
if any one of you is interested, just send me an email. Sorry, I don't, okay, it throw some. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, absolutely impressive presentation. Uh, I don't know what to think. Things uh, are evolving so fast. And I think that even from the very beginning, what we see now, we have uh, so impressive results and so uh, in so different fields that are challenging for us as uh, scientists and as neurosurgeons. So for me, definitely the tomorrow of the scientific work will be completely different. So I'm a little bit frightened. Uh, as far as I see, uh, even the, the large language models that we have nowadays that are, uh, let's say, very rudimentary, very, very initial as structure, very, very basic as structure, uh, are very good uh, in uh, the job that we want to do. So uh, I'm asking myself, what will be our function in a few years? Is there some field that we cannot be substituted? Huh. I think that for the near future, we won't be substituted at the operation room. Uh, these robots are still going to do robots. <laughs> and in the terms of academic work, I still see the our role in uh, in uh, designing the studies, the the ideas that we need to come up um, and and to instruct the the models. I still see the LLMs as as a tool at this point. So there is hope. I uh, definitely yeah. Okay, I see that uh, Nikos and Brown have a question. Nikos. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Martin. It was a very nice presentation. And I think uh, you you touch uh, every single topic on the mother. So absolutely agree. And I think uh, I will qualify as uh, optimistic view that you have about LLM. And I, I want to make comments on the uh, these concerns about uh, fraud or cheating in the scientific uh, publication. And I, I think that is, this uh, particular utility of the tool is also positive because it's showing or revealing uh, the poverty of or the problems that uh, there is nowadays in, in, since many time in uh, the, the world of scientific publication. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have even a word in the jargon for some papers that they, they, they are bananas. You know, there are many publications with uh, that they have uh, uh, completely lack of value whatsoever of uh, in the terms of something something new or, or worthy to be published. So I think that the question is, what is the purpose of publishing in science? And it is, of course, not just to publish, not just to increase the, the curricula of of the, the people, but is to, to communicate new ideas, new discoveries, uh, new data. And uh, that's the purpose, is that's something that uh, LLMs will not provide, will not provide data and will not provide new ideas. So every other uh, publication does not really make sense. And uh, you know, there was this problem, uh, I'm sorry to extend myself, but there was this uh, discussion about uh, the uh, examination to, of medical doctors. So apparently the AI uh, chat box uh, did better than the doctors. And that's not surprising, but that's of, that of course, that's not speak bad of the doctors or the AI, but in reality, it is manifesting the, uh, the, the, the problems in the examination process. Because we uh, forever have discussed that uh, just being able to answer questions in a piece of paper uh, is not the same that solving problems in the, in the clinic. 
So this is uh, the this manifesting this 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 problem. So that was my comment. I have also some comments in data extraction, but I I, I see that uh, Marcel is showing uh, his hand. Yes, thank you, um, Martin. First of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, for giving this fantastic talk. The topic is exciting, and uh, a few years ago we could not even imagine how rapidly this will evolve. And now uh, I have very mixed feelings about this. First one is this excitement and uh, the same feeling when you look at the stars and you see so many and you don't know what is behind these stars. This is exactly the same feeling. And I share the feeling of Nikolai. Uh, I'm also frightened about the potential consequences of this. And the main risks, the main worries I have is, uh, as you very well mentioned, it's lots of ethical questions. Uh, lots of deontological questions. Um, uh, for example, uh, let's say uh, um, last year we, together with the Young Neurosurgeons Committee of the ENS and the Examination Committee, we we tried the ChatGPT and several other uh, other platforms uh, to see how smart they are at answering the questions from the uh, ENS exam. And um, ChatGPT was not worse in many is much better than uh, an average trainee which is doing the exam uh, and this is just the beginning things are likely to evolve so lots of worries is coming with this one is uh, well uh, it it may be discouraging for young neurosurgeons to to spend years to learn so much information why would you do it if you just go uh, look on chat gpt and then you get the answers uh, the other problem is that this is open to anybody which is fantastic uh, but it is equally open to the uh, our patients. So they will obviously look at this for their conditions. They will come to your clinic and they may start questions. And uh, uh, will obviously it may put all of us in uncomfortable position. We cannot know as much as um, chat GPT may know, for example. Um, so uh, my question, I mean, now we are, I think uh, we are living this wild west era where it's still unregulated. Uh, lots of things to come. It comes with multiple benefits. Uh, many of these benefits we don't even suspect, but also multiple dangers. So uh, my question, which is kind of open to you, Martin, is uh, like a visionary question. How do you see this changing in five years' time? What do you see would be, would it be more regulated? Will, will it be more, um, what is going to change in five years' time? Maybe a bit just an uh, open question. Well, I think it's very difficult to say, but my my vision is that the, the the way how we write the articles will change somehow. I think there is no need for these long introductions, these long discussion sections where you cite every paper that was published on this topic, because it's no needed anymore. I think that you can ask just GPT what was what was published and it will give you very very fast. So the, the, I think that the it will the, the excellent will be put on on the data, on the result and on some clinical implication. And I think that uh, at least at least how, how, how I do even it today, I, I'm really reading only the very, very reputable uh, journals from and articles from reputable um, uh, authors. Uh, and I don't really care about, I don't know, some some open access predatory uh, predatory journals, you know. So I think that that's at, at least today, it's the way how you can uh, at, be a little bit more sure that it's a genuine research that you're reading. Okay, we are close to the end of our webinar. Probably one last question from Flor Florian. Florian. Yeah, thank you, Nikolai. Uh, well, th thank you, Martin, for this this very nice presentation. I just got got a question you, uh, concerning concerning publication using Chat GPT. Uh, as you said, it's very easy to write introductions and maybe collect the relevant literature that you need. But have there already been comparisons to using ChatGPT versus doing it the regular way we do it, uh, scanning ourselves PubMed and looking for the relevant publication? Have there been comparisons of whether there are misinterpretations by ChatGPT? Can we just rely on it for the time being, write me an introduction, or do we ask chat gpt to write the introduction we have to thoroughly control it whether each single aspect is is uh, is a correct interpretation of what, what is there as uh, baseline data i am not aware that uh, someone rigorously uh, compared the chat gpt to to human written 
um, article introduction in this way that, that you are mentioning. When I use it, I don't I don't rely on it solely. I I use it more as a language editor. You know, I I, I put an idea and I just check that it it interpreted um, in a correct way. But I'm pretty sure that we will soon see dedicated uh, tools, dedicated uh, software, maybe paid that will uh, improve uh, literature search and 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 will be fine tuned on on our articles so it will give much better results than we can see today from the foundation model general gpt mm -hmm. thanks thank you very much uh, thanks to all of you thank you martin it was extremely interesting and i think that this is just the beginning of a conversation because things are evolving so fast yes. that very soon we shall need another presentation for you demonstrating the advancement in this field. Uh, as far as I saw, we have six more questions, but we don't have time to answer to them. Uh, you will receive them, so you will be able to answer to, uh, to uh, the auditorium. And I'm sure that uh, even probably before the end of this year, we, will, we shall need uh, another meeting and another brief uh, on uh, this very interesting topic. Uh, before ending, I uh, would like to, to, to communicate to you that uh, the collection of abstracts for uh, the European Congress uh, of Neurosurgery is ongoing. Uh, the Congress will be in Sofia in October, uh, so please submit your abstracts. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to have an outstanding scientific program with your help. So thanks to all of you and uh, till the next webinar of uh, the uh, 18 task force. Thank you very much. Thank you.